comes around us and hide us in the secret place of your tabernacle. Hide us under your wings and under your feathers this morning, God. Give us that peace of mind and that sound of need this morning. We ask, God, that you would rebuke every oppression, every attack, every fiery dart, every lie from the enemy this morning. Everyone, God, that is battling things in their life, God, give them the victory this morning to believe here rejoicing and praising you. Because you're not limited and we don't shorten your hands and we ask God that you would make a way for us again today and going forward, God. You see the hearts and minds of every person in this place, God. You see their commitment and you see their desire and you see their work in their lives, God. And you know each and every one personally. And and you are a father, you're not only a father, but you're a friend and a brother that sticks with closer. In Jesus' name, you created us after all. And you breathed your breath into us. And we have a part of you living within us. And thereby you know us personally. You know our weaknesses and our struggles and our hurts and our pains this morning. We leave it all here at your feet. In Jesus' name, we ask God that you would walk these eyes and let your spirit flow in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, we surrender everything. We lay down all these things, all our, our yokes, our heavy burdens. He said, those that are heavy laden, come unto me and ask, and I will give you rest this morning. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for being a good God, a faithful God, a loving God, a kind God. In Jesus' name, thank you this morning. And I ask that you would teach this morning and let it not be me. Let it be you that teaches this morning. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. And those that are praying can continue to pray. Amen. Seek God for as long as you need. That's what the altars are for. Amen. To draw nigh to seek God and to ask of Him. Amen. We're in the right place to be seeking God, to be seeking the Lord at His feet. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Another awesome lesson this morning. Privilege. Hallelujah. The title of the lesson today is The Privilege of Relationship with God. And uh, we're just read down through the lesson. It says there in the lesson, big idea. It says, I will pursue a close relationship with God. Our focus verse is in Exodus 19. And the text encourages that we read the entire chapter, verse 1 to 25, which I did and there is just so much information. I, I dwelt on only one verse and I wasn't able to go through the entire chapter. And, but I'll read verse 5 to 6. It says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation and these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel 
And the truth about God says God desires close relationship with people of faith. Have your way, Lord, in Jesus' name. We give it to you. In Jesus' name. A privilege. What is a privilege? Privilege is a special advantage available to a specific person or to a group of people. And any time, any time we have God, any time we put God on our side, any time we include God in our situation, in our life, in our plans, in our future, in our current situation, any time we include God, our lives become an advantage. We have an advantage over life. We gain the edge. Amen. The lesson big idea says, I will pursue this. I will pursue a close relationship with God. You've got to know something. You've got to understand something that our, our relationship with God and the things that we do is paramount. It is the most important thing that we can ever set out to do in this world. If there's anything that drives or that puts a separation between a relationship with God, there is always going to be hardship. There's always going to be confusion. There's always going to be a loss. And there's always going to be an emptiness and a void in our lives. And we're always going to be searching and seeking. We're never going to be fulfilled. We're never going to be filled. We're never going to fill that void. We're always going to live a life feeling empty, like we're still searching for something, not being satisfied. Amen. But if we include, if we learn how to include God from the moment we open our eyes in the morning to the moment we close our eyes at night, if we include God in every moment, in every situation, everything from our job, our home, our marriage, our kids, everything, we have a better edge. We have a better relationship. God desires a close relationship with people of faith. To have faith is to have hope. To have faith is to be, is to have conviction. To have faith is to have belief in something. To have faith, you have to trust. And that's what God desires, that people have hope in Him, that seek uh, belief and trust Him and believe in Him and be confident in Him and be convicted of His Word and His, his whole ministry, his, his everything there is about God. He desires that we are convicted by even reading, by even uh, attempting to be a part of the ministry. He desires that church would move us. He desires that church could be a uh, fervency in our lives. He desires that we, we come freely wanting to give. He desires that we lift up our love and our hands to Him, us personally, and not to be, not to be ushered in or to have a, a, a cheerleader lead us into His presence, but He desires that we personally enter His throne room. Amen. Yeah. He desires that we offer up that sacrifice that will open up the holies of holies and that, that we can sup with Him, that we can sit with Him. How the Lord desires that. Amen. Amen. 
I have just a, gl a glimpse of what he, he possibly feels, you know, as a father. If you have a son, if you have kids, if you have a son or a daughter, you know, my life changed the moment I, I got my daughter. My life changed even more so with my son being born. There's just something that happens in a father's life. Your heart is stricken. Your whole outlook and your attitude change, changes towards everything. Your whole life surrounds your children. Your whole outlook, your whole focus, your whole burden and desire is that your kid, your child is raised properly. And I only feel that God feels the same way, you know, when I feel what I feel towards my son, you know, just his, the slightest acknowledgement of me, you know, when he, when he comes home and he says, you know, he calls me dad and it moves me. And he sits and he chatters and talks. I sit there and I listen and, and that moves me. And he's just his presence and just him to make his way to me and share stories and, you know, just looking upon him. There's just that emotion that floods over me as a as a father, you know, and I, I relate that to God. You know, how he must feel this overwhelming emotion when somebody enters his, his court. Someone makes his way to his feet and just to sit there and talk to him. How that, how that must overwhelm him and give him so much joy. Amen. Amen. We read there in Exodus 19. It says, if you only obey my word, if you would only be obedient to my word, that's so easily said. But it could be a complete challenge for it can even be a challenge that we're so unaware of. Yet the Bible says, if you could only obey my word and keep my covenant. And then he says, then you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That is the greatest and the grandest of all promises. Hallelujah. And all we have to do are two things. Obey His word and keep His covenant. Yes, amen. <clears throat> What does it mean to obey His Word? To be obedient to what He says. When His Word says, Thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not have any other gods, Thou shalt not covet, Thou shalt not... Those are... That's His Word and that's His covenant. If we can only be obedient to those things, the Bible says to separate yourselves from the world. Don't do the things of the world. Don't act like the world. Don't talk like the world. Don't dress like the world. That's being obedient. Right. Amen. Amen. And there will be a peculiar treasure above everybody around us, above other people. And every Sunday we come here, every Sunday I, I, I talk about His Word and we share, we've gone through two 
quarterlies, two books, and you know, we come every Sunday, I explain his word and his covenant, and I try to explain ways that we can apply his word, and I always encourage that people digest the word. I always encourage people to apply the word, right. pray about it, seek God. The altars are here after service. You can come to God and say, God, that word is for me. God, help me digest. God, let me eat that word. God, plant that word deep with me. God, don't let me forget this word. Amen. We've got to be fervent with his word. We've got to be serious with his word. We've got to be compassionate with his word. It's not just words. These are living words that came out of the mouth of a God Almighty that lives in heaven. Hallelujah. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's where, the, that's where these words came from. God, living, almighty, powerful God. Amen. And I encourage everyone that to always apply His Word throughout the week. Let this Word kind of just bounce around in your mind, in your heart, and think about it and ponder on it. And that's what it means to meditate, to rethink it, to revisit it and go read the lesson, read the scripture, read it over again. And I don't know if it happens to you, you know, when I'm up here, I'm talking about and I bring out certain points and ideas. And I pray that somehow, you know, something triggers in your mind, it takes you back to a thought or a verse or something happens and you're preaching right along with me. And I encourage that. And those thoughts and those words are the still small voice of God that is speaking to you as you're sitting here listening to me. If I were you, I'd jot down those thoughts, those, those thoughts that you get, those examples that come up in your mind and apply it and use it. Let God speak to you. But yet a lot of people, they choose to either not do it, to not apply it. It's the people's choice at the very end. Right. I can't command you to take this word. That is completely on you. As soon as I were done with this lesson, this word, and it's completely your choice what you do with this word. Right. Right. Amen. But why would you sit here, come here every Sunday, sit in class, sit in the church, and be given the pure word of God, and then choose not to apply it, and then choose not to use it, and then choose not to digest it, and then choose not to pray about it, choose not to ponder and meditate about it. And it's so true, the moment we step out the door, we forget. We don't even remember tomorrow what the lesson was. We've got to think so very hard. And... But why come and just not take it further? Right. We put a lot of work into putting together a lesson. We study all week. We read all week. We pray all week. We ask God to touch you people, touch you children. God, use me. Use my voice. Touch God, let me be right. Let me be clean. And we study and, you know, I have a family and I have a job. If I can do it, any one of you can do it. Yes. I have a 40 hour job. I have a family. I have responsibilities in my home. I have a lot of work. I have a, a huge honeydew list at my home. And, you know, I chip away at it and I've got responsibilities. I've got a wife. I've got kids. I've got... But yet, I still make time to come to the church Amen. and pray. I still make time to read His Word. And I still make time to, to make myself an outline. And that's what I have. I have an outline. I jot down word for word. And, and that's what I have. Amen. Amen. That's taking it further. Right. And that's a privilege. That's an advantage that I gain for my family when I do those things. My family, my kids, my son are privileged that they have a father who loves God. 
that who's making an effort to draw nigh and to seek him and to be obedient, to do everything in his power to, to please God and to be of use for God, to be a servant unto God. And I choose to do that and I love my kids. But why come and not take this word any further? Last week we talked about commissioning. We talked about Moses and Joshua. These two men contributed whatever it was that they had in them. They, they, they gave everything that they had within them. These two individuals weren't perfect at all. They had weaknesses, they had faults, they had things in their lives. Moses murdered somebody. That was on his conscience. These guys were perfect men. They weren't set with a specialty um, gift in them. They didn't come with extraordinary powers. They were just human, just like you and me. They were humans just like us. And yet, because of those two men, their efforts and their commitment and their desire, their work reached thousands of years ahead of its time to reach me and convict me yes. and help me yes. and affect me in my life, in my home, my situation. If those two men hadn't done what they've done, would I be here? Would I have what I have today? Would I be teaching about it? No. What those two men did is the reason why we're all here today. How great is that? Just the works of these two men. We have what we have today. We have churches worldwide because of Moses and what Joshua did. If it wasn't for Joshua to lead the people through the Red Sea and onto the land of milk and honey and to them to experience God on the mountaintop and at the base of the mountain and to have to go through all these emotions and trouble and turmoil in their lives to get what we have. Hallelujah. And imagine the effect that you have individually. If Joshua and Moses had the same outcome and just them being who they were, they didn't have a group. It was just them by themselves. Imagine what you are capable. Imagine what you can do. Imagine what you by yourself standing in your home are capable of inspiring. What you are capable of starting. Amen. The first bullet point says faith is a requirement for close relationship with God. That says that without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That word before seek, what do you call that? Is that a Adjective for those of you book word we call them nerds. Is that an adjective? Am I right? But anyway, that word diligently. Diligently means to painstakingly make an effort. Diligently seek means to persevere. It means to take great care and dedicate or commit yourself to diligently seek Him. I want to add something. It says uh, in Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We may not see God. We may not have seen God. We may sometimes not even go days without feeling God. We may go without not ever feeling Him all the time. But we need to make an effort to seek Him with all of our strength, with all of our might, with all of our soul. Yes, amen. 
We need to diligently persevere and strive for Him. We need to be diligent, painstakingly make that effort to draw nigh to God. And that can be done in so many ways. But diligently seeking Him is what the Lord desires. So if we're making an honest effort to seek God, if we're making a diligent effort to build a relationship with God, what does the Bible say He would do? We read it. It says, He rewards. He is a rewarder yes, amen. of them that diligently seek Him. He will reward our efforts. And we won't be left unsure. We won't be left guessing about whether we made a connection with God or not. We will know for sure that God has heard us and has seen us and has come into our situation. We will know without a shadow of a doubt. We will feel His presence. It'll, we can see what God is doing. We can hear what God is doing. We can feel what God is doing. He will overwhelm every situation in our lives and every circumstance. We won't be left guessing, wondering if God heard us. Only God knows how to speak to us. He alone knows how to make His way into our hearts. Remember a few lessons ago, I said, God knows what to do to get our attention. And believing that God exists begins with trusting Him, begins with being obedient with all of your heart to this Word. Amen. That's where believing God begins. Amen. Letter A says, The people of Israel were weak in faith. People of Israel were weak. These are the chosen people of God. No sooner had they crossed the Red Sea, no sooner did God split that Red Sea and they walked across on dry ground. No sooner have they seen all that great miracle, no sooner had they seen Pharaoh's army get decimated, Jesus. that that same group of people that saw this miraculous move of God, no sooner, not, not days later, the Bible says they began murmuring and they began to complain to Moses and Aaron. After seeing what God did in Egypt, in the wilderness, and on the Red Sea, and all the miracles, they were so soon to begin murmuring and complaining. Everybody remember what murmuring is? when you whisper behind leadership or behind church or behind the word and, and you complain and grumble and whisper. It wouldn't be too long after this that there would be the, Israel, the Israelite children would be dancing around a golden calf that they themselves would have made. These people had literally just seen God's presence on Mount Sinai. They looked up and saw the cloud come out of heaven. They looked on the mountain, they saw thunderings and they heard the lightnings. And the Bible says they even heard the voice of God. They heard the trumpets being blown and the wind blowing and they saw the earth quaking and trembling and the land around the mountain being shaken. And now they soon, so soon forget how real God was and how great 
and glorious and powerful God was. They so easily forget. That's having very little weak faith. Right, amen. You know anybody like that? God does so many things in their lives and answers them left to right and miracles being done right before them. And maybe it's even happened to you. Something happens in your life that devastates you and maybe shakes your foundation, shakes your ground, your situation, and it causes you to fear and tremble and quake and 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 you know in the back of your mind that God is dealing with you and in your situation things are happening. And then you pray and then all of a sudden God shows up and He makes a way out for you. God, uh, God, God lays out a path for you. God intervenes in your situation. And then just so soon afterwards, we forget how God has helped us out, has helped us through. Right, amen. We forget all the things that He's done and said and all His promises and we go right back into losing our hope. We go right back into being discouraged and upset and down and out and sad and without hope and unhappy. And amen. We go back to murmuring, complaining, doubting, questioning God. Where are you, God? Right. That's so true. I even do that myself sometimes. After God has healed us, we say, where are you, God? After God has delivered us out of a situation, we say, where are you, God? After God, after God put peace in our mind and our heart, we're like, God, where are you? After God answered our prayers, we say, God, where are you? We somehow just completely forget about the things that God does. Right. That ain't trust. That ain't confidence. That ain't belief. That's having weak faith. The next point says it clearly. Point B, it says to have faith is to trust God regardless of life's circumstances. To have faith is to act according to to the promises of God. Did you catch that? Let me repeat that. To have faith is to act according to the promises of God. We know, we all know what God promised us. Some of you, God promised things to you in your personal, individual life. God spoke to your situation in your life. But we all in general know what God promises us. And there's uh, how many promises in the Word of God? Anybody want to guess? We repeat it so many times. How many promises are found in the Word of God? Who said that? Who has the answer there? What did you say, brother? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a little good guess, though. But I think it's around, what, 300, 3,000? Over 3,000 promises in that book alone that you hold on your lap. 3,000 promises. God promised us and it is recorded and He cannot take it back. He has to live up and fulfill every promise. We, some of us, we, we quote it and we repeat it often. You know, I've got a list of them that I, uh, the scriptures that say that, that those that hope in the Lord, He will renew their strength. He will mount them up on wings as eagles. That's a promise. He says, those of you that are weary and heavy laden, He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. And there's fear not, neither be dismayed. I'm that God, I will uphold you in the right hand. In my right hand, I'll never leave you. There's another promise. And He says, those that ask for wisdom, of God, God will generously give without reproach. We know that those who love God and 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 trust that He will work things together, you know, so many other thousands of promises. But you know, God is more concerned 
about his kingdom than about us having new things. God is more concerned about his kingdom rather than us having new clothing, new houses, or new, a new car. When we act according to the promises of God, we will be more concerned about souls. If when we act according to the promises of God, we look at lost people, lost souls. We worry about where they're going to spend eternity. He goes on to say, faith is conducting our lives in a responsible and forthright manner and believing that the Lord will honor, honor our actions based on our Christian behaviors. Remember, we're called to serve others, not serve ourselves. Remember, we were called to be laborers and workers and servants, not to be catered to or to, to live selfishly for our own benefit, our own gain. It's not about that. It's about others. Remember, the Lord says, once you put others in perspective, you begin to work for them and love them and give to them. I'll supply all your needs. Right, amen. That's another promise. But you and I know that in our world, there's, our lives, this world is full of questions and uncertainty. We can choose to answer all those questions and uncertainty with faith, with belief, and trust in His Word. But yet so many people today choose to fill in those blanks with fear, with anxiety, with the expectation of the worst that could happen. Many people carry their past traumas, their past mistakes, their past failures, their childhood failures and all the abuses that they had gone through. That's all people know. That's all people live. That's all people repeat in their minds, in their situation. They go back. They use it as a crutch and as, as an excuse to not move forward. I can't get past this. It's stuck in me. I can't get rid of it. It's in me. It's who I am. That's a lie. Amen. We, care. We, we, we have never built ourselves a library of victories. We've never built ourselves in our conscience, in our mind, a library of accomplishments that we can go to and draw from. But yet we have so much, our library is filled with all this other junk that I just mentioned. Right. And that's all we keep regurgitating. That's all we keep drawing out. This trouble, this path, this failure, this, this no good that happened to me. This, this situation, this circle, this. We don't have a library of victories and accomplishments and prayer, the prayers that God answered. We don't have a testimony that we can go to and draw from and remember. Those things can help our faith. We need to keep track of all the things that God has done in our lives. All the ways that He's moved and made a way for us. And we need to record it and we need to remember it and go over God. I know you moved in my situation here and you are able and more able to do it for me again today. I need your help because you helped me in this situation years ago. And I know you're still the same God that you were back then. And you're still the same God today. We need to build a library of answered prayers so that we can live a life of power, of faith, and confidence, and not of fear and doubting. Fear cripples you. Fear just crushes you down. We have more bad memories. We have more bad outcomes. We have more sad stories. We have more of those than we do stories of great testimonies. When was the last time you, someone came to you so excited that they wanted to share what God has done for them this past week? How many of you have ever seen somebody come up and say, Hey, brother, can you give me a moment here after service or something, even before? I, want to have, I have a testimony. I want to share with the people what God has done, what God is doing. 
It was so on their heart and on their mind. They were so overwhelmed and so overjoyed by it. We hardly see that. Right. Hardly ever hear any testimonies. Next point says we can trust God at all times. It says there, if you read that letter C and right there in the paragraph, it says, God's not an abusive father, nor is he a manipulative charlatan who's waiting to exploit us at our first sign of weakness. What is a charlatan? Charlatan is a fake, he's a, an imposter, a, a deceiver, a liar, a fake. That's what a charlatan is. But God doesn't want, God doesn't wait for us to do wrong. God doesn't wait for us to stumble and fall so that he can punish us and condemn us. Right. God doesn't keep a list of all the wrongs and the mistakes and things that we've done wrong and all our junk in our life. He doesn't keep record of that. Amen. We can trust God with our hearts. And we can trust Him with our most intimate needs. That deep, dark emotion that we're unsure of. That, that nobody knows or understands. Only God can understand and know those things. Emotions. Amen. It says Jesus already satisfied God's wrath at Calvary. So therefore we are safe to give him our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole everything. He bought it anyways. He suffered for it anyways. He paid the price already anyways. Amen. So knowing that we can lower our, these barriers in our life that hold us back, we need to remove those and allow the Holy Ghost to infiltrate our hearts and to come into our, our lives and open up to Him and let Him begin to mend and heal and to strengthen our hearts and our minds and build our faith. It says at the base of Mount Sinai, God had to make a statement of authority. That's when the mountain was trembling and the people were fearing. They said, God, we, Moses, we don't want to go. You go up there. You talk to God. There was hearing and seeing all these things, the mountain shaking. And it's interesting, our lesson right here, this is where I spent all week on this point, but uh, I wish we could talk about it a little more. But what the Lord was doing was He was setting a stage to develop respect and take their relationship to a new level. What God was doing was causing the people a change in their heart and their mind, their, their whole complete attitude, character, situation. He was moving them to a higher, closer walk with God. Yes. A greater trust, a greater belief, a greater hope, a greater conviction, a more moving, satisfied life with God. That's what his intention was. So whenever God draws him near to anybody, what happens? Sin is exposed. Sin is highlighted. People get uncomfortable when, you know, when God draws near to your situation. God causes a humbling effect. You realize you're, you're, you're a sinful, no good person. That's God. That's that mountain shake, and that's the fear of people. That's a that's the Lord setting the stage for you to develop respect and to have a greater relationship with Him. Amen. And when that happens, we know not to visit that place again, right? Amen. Because it was a, a, a scary experience. We develop a healthy respect for the things of God after those things happen. Later on in the chapters, I don't know if some of you read that, Exodus 19, later if you read down the chapter, it talks about God talk or telling Moses to set up boundaries at the foot of the mountain so people don't cross those boundaries. Those ba boundaries are things that keep us safe. Those boundaries are things that guard us and secure us. Boundaries and barriers are things that cover us and guard us. 
These things are our standards. Those barriers are our standards, which is holiness, which is righteous living, which is separation from the world, which is distinction from the world. Because we're not like this world. We are not of this world. We're only pilgrims passing through. We don't do things like the world does. We don't talk like the world does. We don't think like the world thinks. We don't, we don't pursue things that the world pursues. We have a whole different focus, a whole different vision. We're not like the people of this world. We're different. We're a holy generation. We are a holy group of people. Separated by God. What we pursue and our goals are different from this world. Next point says the new covenant provides close relationship with God. After Jesus died on the cross and he spilt his blood, that was what brought us closer to God. Him shedding his blood is what brought us closer in relation to God. That's when we became a royal priesthood. No longer did the priests have to go to the tabernacle and offer up incense to get into the holies of holies. No longer did the priests have to offer up lambs and goats and to wash our sins away. After that, after Jesus shed his blood, we are now the high priest. We, our own selves, can now approach the holies of holies. We can offer up our own incense. We can make, we can make our own way personally into the presence of God. We no longer need a priest to offer sacrifice. We are a holy generation. We are a royal priesthood. We now don't have to offer goats, but we can repent and we can be baptized in Jesus' name. We can be filled with the Holy Ghost. We are a, we are a royal priesthood. No longer is that work being done outside visibly. All that work takes place inside of us now. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 8 and 6, so I'll end with this. It says, Jesus established a new covenant. It says it was a more excellent ministry. And it is a better covenant on better promises. The old covenant worked outside the body. But this new covenant works inside of us. In our heart, in our mind, our soul. Amen. What an awesome privilege to be! it is to be a part of it. That work, that ministry. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, if you've repented of your sin, if you've been baptized in Jesus' name, you are now a royal priesthood capable of having the same works as a priest did in the wilderness, in the tabernacle. And that tabernacle is no longer a building out in the middle of nowhere. That tabernacle is here, us. You are that tabernacle. And that your temple is filled with the Holy Ghost, that spirit. We don't have to go anywhere to get it. We are here. We are the tabernacle. We are the temple. We are the priest. We are a royal priest. And we are a holy nation. That is so awesome. We enjoy a complete, fulfilling relationship with God when He comes and lives inside of us. He writes, now instead of writing on clay tablets or inspiring people to he writes those commandments in our hearts he writes those commandments on our hearts and on our minds when God's dealing with you and talking with that still small voice that's God writing and dealing with you and writing on the table of your heart that's so awesome if you draw nigh if you're committed if you desire him if you if you want more of him it's, you can have as much of God as you desire. You can have 110% of God in you, around you. It is possible. But yet, it's obvious that we, we, we're not at that level yet. We're not at that point yet. Even as ministers, I mean, we fall short. But He's there. He's, we can have as much as Him as we so desire. Amen. God is limitless. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand for a moment.
Hallelujah. Let's thank Him for His Word for just a moment. And I encourage you again, Lord, help me remember this Word. Lord, let Your Word become open in my heart and mind. Let Your Word settle in my heart. Let Your Word take root. Let me draw nigh. I, I want a better relationship with You. I want to better be able to seek You with all my heart, with all my strength, with everything that's within me. Help me to block out the world and all its troubles and all its glamour and whatever else it tries to offer. Help me to fix my eyes on You and Your purpose and Your plan and Your work and Your commissioning and Your calling. Help me to fulfill my duties and my calling and my work and my ministry. Help me to get my eyes off the world and help me to put my eyes on You because it is important. And that is why we've all been called and sent with a, a work and a ministry in these last days, these last hours. People are counting on us. People are hurting in the world and they need a place of refuge. They need a place to run to. And we are that church. We have the power. We have the answer. We have the word. And it's all in you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.